Hi, Matt. Hey, how's it going? Good. I'm Sarah Posner. This is The Posner Show. And my guest today from across the pond is Matt Anderson. He is um, a writer and philosopher. Uh, he blogs at Mere Orthodoxy, and his recent book is The End of Our Exploring. It's a book about doubt and Christianity, and he's currently studying at Oxford. And it's nice to have you again. Uh, thanks for having me on. I always enjoy chatting with you. Same. So we're going to talk today about the fallout from Governor Jan Brewer's veto of SB 1062, the amendments to uh, Arizona's Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Uh, and in the wake of that, there's been a huge conservative outcry against Brewer's veto. Um, it's been characterized, uh, well, the, the failure of the bill and the um, efforts uh, by pro-LGDP LGBT activists to characterize it as um, uh, a licensed uh, the bill as a license to discriminate that has all resulted in um, outcry from conservatives describing the progress of gay rights as persecution of Christians. Um, uh, Tony Perkins described uh, Governor Brewer yielding to cultural bullies. Brian Fisher said that, yeah, Jim Crow is back, but it's the the gay people who are trying to oppress the Christians. Uh, and this weekend in the New York Times, Ross Douthat had a column where he basically said, you know, look, you know, we're on a path to the Supreme Court uh, ruling that same-sex marriage bans are unconstitutional. Um, and this might result in a, I'm paraphrasing, cultural marginalization of Christians who are opposed to same-sex marriage. Um, but uh, we shouldn't call it persecution. And he also took uh, conservatives to task for their, I think the word he used was uh, uncharitable or uh, their own intolerance towards gays, which he sort of suggested was, um, you know, part and parcel of the whole escalation of the culture war around these issues. So what do you think? Is it persecution? Yeah, that's the question that all my conservative friends are asking about Ross. I mean, it's hard to get a serious hearing out in public, I think, calling, say, the loss of tax-exempt status persecution, or um, in this case, the inability to pass religious liberty expansions, um, that's clearly not persecution. That's a, presumably a disagreement over the nature of, uh, this may be a charitable way of putting it, but a, a, a social disagreement over the nature and meaning of religious liberty and its boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so calling that persecution strikes me as absurd, if not ludicrous. Um, but I think there is, you know, he mentioned in his piece um, things like the loss of uh, potential loss of tax exempt status for, say, conservative religious institutions, and, and, and uh, you know, there it starts uh, colleges and universities in particular, um, and there it starts to become a little bit more live as an option. Um, well, let's talk about that. We did talk a little bit about it on Twitter last week um, because it's an issue that conservatives have raised, and I guess there's been, there have been some liberal writers who've raised it that, you know, uh, some churches or religious organizations should have their tax exempt status revoked. For the record, um, I don't agree with that. Um, but I looked into as a historical matter, is there any precedent for the IRS revoking the tax exempt status of churches or religious organizations? Should they not, um, you know, should they choose to not comply with any changes in anti-discrimination laws as they pertain to gay people. And I guess the root of this fear among conservatives is the revocation of Bob Jones University's tax exempt status in the early 1970s. Uh, the case, um, it was litigated and wasn't decided by the Supreme Court until the 1980s, but uh, that resulted from Bob Jones University, which is a fundamentalist college in, in South Carolina, uh, still having a policy banning interracial dating. And 
because uh, the court found that we had reached this consensus against segregation and racism, that it was uh, against public policy to give um, this uh, university a tax exemption, given that, given that consensus. And I talked to a, a First Amendment expert who said, well, you know, we really ha we don't have that consensus on gay rights right now. So it's not really um, that's not really an argument that would be going anywhere in terms of revocation of um, nonprofits tax exempt status for that or discrimination against gays. And I guess you said to me on Twitter, well, that's what you're worried about. You're worried that we are headed toward that sort of consensus. Yeah, I mean, it seems a rather uh, thin read to build the case on um, if it's consensus. I mean, the, the LGBT uh, lobby has done such an effective job of drawing a parallel between um, race and sexual orientation in the eyes of the law that um, once one becomes a protected class, once race becomes a protected class, and, and it, it becomes clear in the eyes of the government that, that um, the government has a vested interest in overturning institutionalized discrimination, um, then it seems like it's a pretty easy parallel to um, make to sexual orientation. Um, well, because that's the parallel that's been made all along. Um, and so I, well, it's hard to find a, a reason why it wouldn't obtain in that case. Well, remember, too, right, that in between now and when uh, race was recognized as a protected class, there was the um, legal event of gender being um, recognized as a protected class. And, you know, churches still discriminate against women, you could argue, you know, churches that don't ordain women. I mean, the Catholic Church doesn't ordain women. Um, the Southern Baptist Convention, I mean, I guess uh, congregationally some Southern Baptist churches might ordain women, but as a, as a matter for the, for the denomination, they don't, they don't ordain women. And even though gender is a protected class, you haven't seen any churches or religious organizations like universities have their tax exempt status revoked for refusing to ordain women. So to me, that's a more on point uh, parallel. And because there's been absolutely nothing done uh, in that department, this seems more analogous to that than to the Bob Jones well, situation. I mean, that's a really good point. There's two ways to look at that. One is that um, there's a, a rational basis for allowing that to happen. And the other is that the perhaps feminist uh, lobby hasn't been as effective at, uh, at, as the LGBT lobby has at um, undermining that discrimination in the eyes of the law. So, I, you know, it's certainly nowhere near, I think, as plausible at this point as um, uh, ending uh, tax, exempt, tax exemptions for uh, religious schools on the basis of sexual orientation is. But um, two years ago, I went and looked for it, and I haven't been able to find it, but two years ago, there was a, a, a book of legal scholarship put out by OUP where uh, uh, the one of the authors in this collection of essays made the case that Bob Jones, uh, that that precedent should be applied to institutions like the Catholic Church and so on, um, precisely for the reasons that you're saying, namely they discriminate on the basis of sex. So there are legal arguments that are out there that are being made um, that would want to apply that uh, in, all the way across the board. So. I, you know, there's no way, the difficulty of this uh, whole conversation as a conservative is that there's no real way to say something like, there's a, there's a meaningful, like, like, this isn't a crazy scenario that we're lining up. Like, once we start talking about uh, conservative religious schools losing their tax-exempt status, the response that I get is either, one, you're crazy paranoid. Why, you know, like that's ridiculous. Or two, um, something like, well, you've got it coming to you. Um, and you sound kind of whiny when you're worrying about that. Um, which is, a, which is, it's a tough bind to be in. 
I suppose. Right. Well, let's let's set aside for a moment all of the internal dysfunction at the IRS, which has prohibited it from yeah. <laughs> even uh, <laughs> conducting any kinds of audits of, of churches in the past four or five years anyway. Um, so, I mean, like there, there's there's sort of a practical, functional reason why this probably won't happen. We, I don't think the IRS has the... I don't think it has the political will or the person power or the bureaucratic procedures to even deal with something like this. Yeah, no, that's but, right. I mean, weirdly, as a conservative, um, institutional, the institutional behemoth and the slow moving to, you know, wheels of the government are our best friends right now, right? Like, <laughs> it's just such a mess that um, we're all going to slide by for the next 20, 30 years, more likely. Right. Most so, likely. But let's, let's, let's set that aside for the moment and, and talk about the, the question of whether this should or shouldn't happen uh, uh, philosophically or legally or politically speaking. Um, and I think that with race, I, I mean, I think that when you look at the history of uh, legal precedent on, on uh, the uh, school desegregation, particularly, so when you look at the traje trajectory of that and everything that happened in this country after Brown versus Board of Education, ending segregation in schools, uh, particularly when they were being given basically a tax subsidy, that's what the tax exemption is, um, it, that seemed to be much more connected to ending something that as a society we had basically all, not all, but you know, most people had agreed on uh, that schools should not be segregated. And it wasn't considered a, oh, well, that's your theology that, that black people are um, lesser humans than white people. I mean, it, that, that, was, that was no longer um, socially acceptable. Now, on the ordination of women question, I think that that, I mean, to me, that is something that I can never see the government uh, trying to intervene on. So like you wouldn't see, say, a woman knocking on the door of a Catholic seminary and saying, admit me, please. I, you know, I need to, um, I need to become a priest um, and then filing a lawsuit. And I don't know, has that ever happened? Has a woman ever filed a discrimination lawsuit against a Catholic seminary or the Catholic church saying that, their ban on ord or ordaining women is violates her civil rights, constitutional rights. I hope not, but uh, I mean, I don't. Yeah. You know, I just don't see that as. Um, I don't see that as plausible. Now, on the other hand, when you have something like public accommodations, which I think are treated differently than educational institutions, and churches, that's where these flashpoints in these religious freedom laws at the state level have come up. They're not, they're not gay people saying to a Catholic priest or uh, to uh, an evangelical preacher, you know, we want you to perform our wedding ceremony. They're more of the caterer, baker, photographer sort of cases. And those, those are not recognized as religious institutions. And, and given that sort of leeway to have your theology, even though it may run counter to uh, what many people in our con culture consider um, an unequal situation with regard to sex, gender, sexual orientation. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, it, the point about consensus is a good one. I mean, consensus runs a lot of different directions. It wasn't um, just a widespread consensus socially, but um, theologically, you know, Bob Jones, within the history of the church and even um, in its own time, was a pretty considerable minority of Christians mm -hmm. in America. Right. Um, whereas on sexual orientation, um, you know, the conservative Christian view on this is pretty mainstream um, within religious communities in America and um, historically has tons and tons of substantive support behind it for mm -hmm. you know, some cases stated well and some cases not. Um, so, I, you know, I, I do think there are disanalogies there that are, that are worth noting. Um, but I think, you know, the question of public accommodations and whether or not people have um, the freedom 
to associate in the ways that they would like to in those uh, situations. I mean, partly the, the, the question that I have about the whole Arizona bill and everything is whether or not there's going to be space for vendors to be wrong um, about decisions that, uh, about how they want to do their business, uh, how they want to run their business, um, without being subject to punitive measures or, or lawsuits or that you know the hassle of dealing with that. Um, socially, I think. You know, I, I do worry that um, there's there's kind of a, a incredible restrictiveness that's being placed around this issue where there, there isn't freedom to be wrong on it. Um, and, and when you say freedom, freedom to be wrong, wrong, wrong in the eyes of, in whose guys. eyes would they be wrong? P potentially, potentially. Um, both Christians and the broader societies, right? So if Jesus bakes the cake, for um, the, the gay wedding, as some Christians have argued over the past two weeks. Um, if Jesus would bake the cake, that's certainly one argument. But um, some Christians, and, and let's say that in fact that's true, that Jesus absolutely would. Some Christians are going to think that that's wrong and that Jesus wouldn't. And they may deliberate about it badly, they may get it wrong, but they're still... You know, people of good faith, um, people who are not necessarily malicious, they just have deep fundamental um, convictions and reservations about participating in this sort of activity. And the question legally and, and socially, really, is whether or not we're going to allow people um, like that to be wrong about things, to err in their conscience. So I'm listening to you and I'm wondering where you fall in that. If you owned a photography business, say, what would you do? Yeah, um, I don't think I would uh, take photos of it. Um, mm -hmm. Weddings are um, expressive acts that um, inaugurate realities and... Um, they're unique. They're, they're unique for everyone. And certainly photography is much more than, um, it's, it's more than, uh, I don't know, even just going to a gay wedding. Um, there's a responsibility and a fidelity to um, present the wedding in such a way that makes it as aesthetically compelling, as beautiful, that uh, honors it and um, elevates it. And um, I, you know, as someone who would have deep moral reservations about the, the, the gay wedding, I don't think I could do that in good conscience. Um, I'd say the same at this point about uh, heterosexual weddings of divorced couples where I knew that they had been divorced without cause. Um, and so it was, it's really a question of you saying to yourself, I could not do this, the justice that is required of this, of this sort of event. Yeah. Uh, because, yeah. So it's, you, it almost sounds like what you're saying is I couldn't do what these customers are asking me to do. I couldn't do my best work for these customers. Yeah, so I had a tough time. I worked in finance for a couple of years selling investments to people. And, oh. um, <laughs> That's not fraught with moral questions. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I talked myself out of working in finance because I had such a difficult time um, selling products to clients that I was not myself owning or um, had plans to own or thought that I could own in that situation. Like, I just couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, and so you can look at me and say, I've got an overactive conscience, and really, like, I should just go have a couple of pints of ale and get on with my life and, and be a little bit more relaxed about things. Um, and maybe that's true. Maybe I should just relax about this sort of stuff. Um, but there is a sense in which I think 
the moral life for Christians um, connects with every expressive action, every activity that we partake in. Um, there's no area that's not subject to some sort of moral scrutiny. Um, and that's, a, that's just a really high standard. But what you're saying sounds very different to me than what a lot of the defenders of the Arizona bill were saying about why they thought it was required. Because to me, what you're saying is, I couldn't in good conscience I couldn't in good conscience do this for this gay couple because I wouldn't, I wouldn't make it, I wouldn't feel comfortable making it beautiful, et cetera. Um, and, or the photographs would not be transcendent in a way that is demanded of wedding photos. If I could yeah, photograph exactly. anyways, I mean, we just have to note I'm a terrible, terrible <laughs> photographer. Right. We'll assume that. Right. Yeah. But I think that what a lot of the defenders of, of the bill were saying is you know, this is, the forcing of the homosexual agenda on Christians and forcing them to violate their conscience. And that's like a very different sort of statement to make about it than what you're saying. So, I mean, there's two sides of it. So there's, there, there is the moral question for Christians. Could the Christian take the photos? Um, then there's the question of, could the Christian be compelled by force of law or by the threat of, you know, hours and hours, hundreds of hours and thousands of dollars fighting um, in a courtroom uh, to avoid having to take the vote. And I think what, what the bill was for was the latter case. It's to allow um, those who, like me, have the moral judgment that we do about our own complicity in expressive moments like weddings, uh, the space to say no to those, to decline participation in those weddings by way of um, taking photographs of them or providing takes or so on and so forth, um, without the burden of lawsuits or the, the force of law. Um, and, but, so, and so I think, I mean, from my standpoint, there's a, there's a real question to those who are LGBT sympathizers, why they would want to compel someone um, on, on, on pain of lawsuit to take the photographs. It's, it's well, weird to me. Well, you know, it, they, the pro-LGBT uh, forces in Arizona didn't raise this, right? So in Arizona, uh, it's, a lot of the Arizona proponents of SB 1062 said that they were prompted to act because of the Elaine photography case, which was right next door in New Mexico. New Mexico's uh, anti-discrimination laws prohibit discrimination in public accommodations for a variety of protected classes, including on the basis of sexual orientation. Arizona's law uh, prohibits discrimination against a variety of protected classes, but does not include uh, sexual orientation. So unlike in New Mexico, in Arizona, the couple that went to the photographer, the same thing happening in Arizona, that couple would not have that same cause of action that the couple in New Mexico had. So it was, so there's no, there's no recourse. There's no recourse for the turned away gay couple in Arizona. So it seemed like the purpose of the bill in Arizona was to double down on the ability to turn somebody away and to use, to explicitly use discriminate uh, religion as uh, a reason to turn them away as opposed, you know, I mean, the reality is they were already free to do that without invoking anything at all. They could have just said, you know, yeah, so no, I, no, I won't do it. it. And it seems pretty clear, um, that the conservative motivation was prompted by things like Elaine photography and so on. Um, you know, one, I will just say one, um, and I don't know how anyone resolves this, but um, one of the difficulties, it seems to me, of expanding uh, of an over-legalized culture where um, many of these social disagreements and so on, we've turned to force of law in order to remedy them, whether that's through uh, carving out uh, protected classes or through um, 
you know, mediating the, the, the experience of wrongs through lawsuits or those sorts of things. Um, one of the downsides of all of that is people feel impelled to expand protections as much as possible. And that creates, I think, a social environment that is more prone to have these sorts of disputes come up when they may not ever arise otherwise, because people wouldn't be thinking necessarily when they got turned away. Now I'm going to go use force of law to get, um, to get what I want. So there's a sense in which I think um, I don't know all the ins and outs of the Arizona bill and what folks were thinking on it uh, about it. Um, there's a sense I think when they were um, probably preemptively trying to get ahead of difficulties that they see coming. Um, and I think that's understandable given the sort of climate that we're in and um, the tendency among those who are LGBT sympathizers to um, appeal to force of law in places where they can um, in ways that I think are, are problematic. And I don't mean to, well, and I, it, which is why I preface this with, like, this is a general problem. I actually don't just mean to single them out. I, I think lots of people do that, and, and it's not good. Well, I think that some of these cases become notorious, like the Elaine photography case, for example. But I think in the vast majority of cases, people are going and hiring a photographer for their wedding, and, it, you know, it's, it, it's a not, a not a thing. It's not a thing that escalates into a lawsuit. I mean, I think that some, these these instances that become legal cases are very isolated, but then tend to get blown up as some sort of um, indicator of some larger phenomenon or larger problem. But, you know, most people who are getting married, you know, they shop around for a photographer and one photographer might tell them, no, I'm not available that day or I'm booked or what have you. And they finding a photographer who they're perfectly satisfied with and life goes on without any kind of controversy whatsoever. Um, but I think that in Arizona, the thing that people were concerned about was that, you know, this is not really just about, you know, the photographer who turns around the, away the gay couple because they don't want to do a, a same-sex wedding ceremony. But it's also the question of, well, if, if you allow that, then can the hotel owner turn you away because, you know, you're not married, even if you're straight, you know, you're not married and you, the hotel owner disapproves of um, uh, premarital sex. And, you know, so like, it's, it's just a, where does it go? I mean, if you, if you have decided that you're going to engage in commercial activity and put yourself out there as a business owner who provides these services, then, you know, our, our culture is you take, people regardless of whether you uh, the color of their skin or whether you disagree with their quote unquote lifestyle yeah um, so that sort of like where does it end um, question. I know both, both sides, sides have their way where does it end yeah question. and I'm not sure that um, it's any different it goes away at all um, even if the law doesn't pass. I mean, if we carve out these things one by one through lawsuits um, and uh, do it piecemeal, if our religious liberty conceptions are put together that way, then we're still going to have lots of theoretical cases where we can run, where lots of problems uh, potentially come up and we're, we're left wondering, you know, what's, what, what would happen in that sort of case? What sort of wrong would get decided and, and what would be the repair to it? Um, so in one sense, I, I want to say something like, yeah, that the, the problem of the criteria, as it were, for deciding these sorts of things is a real problem. But it doesn't seem to me um, that uh, not putting the law in place gets us past it at all. And in one sense, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm overly optimistic. Uh, maybe, um, maybe I should be more of a dour pessimist about the world. Um, but I kind of think that um, 
if this sort of law was put in place and business owners were, would be protected, um, not much would have changed and um, people would have kept on doing their thing. Because as you said, you know, very few cases where these come up. But the very few cases where they do come up become um, major sticking points for our culture work. Because, you know, what would we pundits and what would the think tanks and the, or the lobbying organizations do without high profile cases to, to send out fundraising letters off of? <laughs> um, but, I, but I do think if the vast majority of situations um, are going to work out okay anyways, um, then in one sense, it makes sense to me to be overly protective of people's freedom to have the associations that um, they think are right to have. Well, what do you think is going to happen? So we have these cases uh, in Utah, Oklahoma, Virginia, where federal judges invalidated the same-sex marriage bans in those states. Um, using the logic of the Windsor case, and some of them citing Justice Scalia's dissent in the Windsor case that basically said, you know, this case means that all of those same-sex marriage bans are, at the state level are going to fall. Uh, so let's assume for the sake of argument that one of those cases, well, one of those cases will go to the Supreme Court, but let's assume for the sake of argument that the Supreme Court strikes down as unconstitutional, uh, these state-level bans on same-sex marriage. So then, wh what's next? I mean, what is going to happen? Are conservatives, Christians going to, I mean, is it really going to change their lives that much in the, se in the sense that they'll still be able to do what they do and say what they believe and practice what they believe in their churches. Uh, it doesn't change uh, their theology. It doesn't force any change on their theology. So, but I can imagine that it's going to cause some kind of cultural cataclysm for them. Yeah. Um... I, there's a question for me as to whether, um, whether in fact conservatives will be outraged or um, we will uh, respond like it is a cataclysm. Um, mm -hmm. We may be cataclysmed out, uh, to put it one way. I'm not sure how much more um, we have to, to go before we're just thoroughly exhausted. Um, but I think there's 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 a conversation happening within conservative Christian worlds about what's next, and you know you have language um, that Rod Dreher has popularized about the Benedict Option, um, a kind of retrenchment into smaller communities where um, traditional Christian values about sexuality and so on are not just talked about, but lived and handed on within generations as a way of um, not escaping from the broader culture, um, but almost a monastic type strategy. If we're going we're gonna to carry on um, the, the inheritance that we had received um, within the broader what culture. What would that look like, though, that's, in terms of... No one has any idea. That's the okay. question. <laughs> I, it sounds really lovely. Um, you know, whether that's moving to patches of land in you know, northern New Mexico or what have you, um, who knows? Um, and I don't think that's what it means. But, but, but there is a, a conscious awareness that um, conservative Christians need to return to uh, living out, first and foremost, the commitments of marriage that we believe in and handing those on within our own communities, uh, which we have done a woeful job of. We've been just atrocious at. And that's not the gay's fault. And No. No. No, no. I mean, I mean you know, contrary to a lot of fulminating by some conservatives, 
I'm not talking about you, obviously. You know, it's not it's not because of same sex marriage that this phenomenon that you're talking about has taken place. Yeah. So one cheeky line when I've made arguments against um, same sex marriage, because I'm that retrograde, um, that I still do that. Uh, but one cheeky line that I've used is something like, yeah, marriage is a mess. Um, why would you want it? Um, you, like, you're entering a broken institution, and um, that we are all so culturally confused about it in such a way is just sort of further evidence about it. But is it a broken institution? I mean, individual marriages are broken, but I don't understand why as an institution it's broken. Because, you know, every marriage is unique. So I guess I don't get, and I hear conservatives make that argument that as an institution it's broken. But I, I never understand it because to me, you know, this person's marriage to that person is just this unique uh, relationship that can't really be judged against, you know, sort of a broader, you know, quote unquote institution that is marriage. Yeah, except I don't know how unique our marriages are. I mean, so if you ask marital therapists about why, um, so if I went into a marital therapist and said, hey, I've got issues X, Y, and Z in my marriage, and I do have issues in my marriage, of course, um, one of the things that they're going to start talking about is family history and the patterns of relating that I saw in my parents and that my wife saw in her parents. Um, and those things get passed on often unwittingly, often not verbally, um, just because that's what we do, which is why there's some sociological evidence that you can, um, uh, that, that divorce, uh, that, that grandchildren are more likely to get divorced if their grandparents did, that you can trace the effects of divorce on a family tree through three generations. Right. And I understand what you're saying about that. But I think that, like, I still, still to me, an institution being broken is, you know, to me that the, the reason why marriages fail or marriages have problems are myriad. You know, they're sociological, they're sometimes economic, they're, you know, personal, they're psychological. I mean, like there's, there's so many different factors that it's just, you know, it's a function of human relationships that there are, there are going to be these issues that come up in a marriage or, you know, in a friendship or, you know, people have issues with their parents or their siblings or what have you. Right. And so I, I guess I still don't understand that this, ins, you know, this institution is broken because I think con conservatives often will blame this on you know, not necessarily on, on same-sex marriage, but also, you know, on, you know, the sexual revolution and feminism and what have you. And to me, it's just like, it, it's like a euphemism of sorts for saying, like, we don't really like the way uh, American culture has evolved over the past uh, six or seven decades. And so we're going to say that marriage as an institution is um, in trouble. But you know, marriage, you know, still works for people if they have the will and the desire and the wherewithal to make it work. So don't, I guess to me, it's like, why it's not an institutional problem. It's a personal and sometimes societal problem. You, you, there's a lot. What are you adding there when you say, and sometimes societal? Um, well, when I say societal, I think I'm talking about something different than what you're talking about. So, I mean, to me, I think that is societally speaking, you know, we're too entrenched in traditional gender roles where, you know, the wife does most of the housework and the father and the husband is, uh, you know, the principal breadwinner and doesn't do, doesn't share in the housework and so on. That's what I'm talking about. But I think that when conservatives talk about it, they're talking about something different. Yeah. Um, it is. So I could, I could see how someone would think that it would be a euphemism. The conservative mindset um, it's sometimes hard to get inside of. I'm sure you struggle with that a lot. Um, <laughs> I, I try, though. I do. <laughs> do. Um, in, in part, so, uh, to again, quote Rod Dreher. Um, Rod Dreher had a piece that got passed around conservative circles last year sometime on the arguments for marriage. Uh -huh. Used this language of cosmological um, 
So the reasons for traditional marriage are cosmological. They are, um, they, they infiltrate everything, everything infiltrates them. Um, and there's something to that, the, the, the pieces, it's very, very hard to make the case for traditional marriage because um, the presuppositions and the intuitions that you have to have for the case to be persuasive um, are in many cases just so foreign to people because we haven't thought that way for 30 years, um, 30, 40 years. Um, and so there, there are just so many different moving parts. But I do think the language of um, institutional decline, um, it seems to me that the progressive mindset doesn't want to acknowledge the possibility of institutional decline. Um, and as such, there's no way to speak across the gap such that I could point to things that would persuade you. Right. And I think that progressives do talk about institutional decline, but I think it's more along the lines of what I was talking about, that you know, marriage doesn't work for women uh because uh, you know if you stay home with the kids and your husband works and then he dumps you for a secretary then you know you're you're screwed and <laughs> um and i mean I, I don't think that conservatives look upon that scenario very favorably either but i think maybe for different reasons um so i i, I understand that there are these arguments about it like as an institution that it's it doesn't work um and I guess, I mean, I, and I do understand that conservative arguments about it are based in these ideas of what marriage is and um, what women and men's roles are vis-a-vis -vis each other. Um, but I still think that the argument that it's in decline is a result of conservative discontent with changes in gender roles in American society over the past few decades. Yeah. Um, I mean, I is, mean that is that a fair, fair yeah. conclusion to draw? I, or is it is there more to it than that? I think there's, I mean, naturally, I think there's more to it than that. Um, namely, that it's actually in decline. Um, and, it, and we're discontented. Um, we're unhappy with the state of affairs precisely because of the decline that we ourselves have been complicit in and that we see as harmful for American society going forward. How have you been complicit in it? Oh, I mean, all the standard conservative lines about, you know, our own capitulation on divorce, um, uh, our own, I would say evangelicals, our own, um, used properly, theological language, which may be weird, but uh, sexual idolatry. Um, mm -hmm. Evangelicals have their own sexual revolution starting in the 1970s when um, pleasure within the marriage bed becomes the metric for happy married sex. Um, and, you know, there are lots of ways in which evangel the evangelical narrative about sexuality has um, undermined our own uh, marital commitments and um, made the logic of the institution of marriage much more difficult, um, even within our own communities. So one thing that I think that you lose with it when the institution goes away is something like um, an unreflective sense that this union is going to be forever, where um, that the default is permanence, and exceptions to that are um, just that. They're exceptions. And you don't have to reflect about the permanence, that you don't have to sort of like especially commit yourself. There's nothing internally extra that you have to do to, to sort of talk yourself into the permanence. It's just when you get married, that's what marriage is. It's permanent. Um, I think even within the evangelical community, um, we don't have that default sense about marriage. We talk ourselves into the permanence because permanence isn't necessarily a feature of marriage um, that we see anymore. Um, and that 
reliance on internal commitment, that reliance on the, the sort of extra movement of the will, if you will, um, to keep the marriage together, over personalizes it and, and places a lot of stress on the couple as the couple. Um, and I actually think makes marriage harder. Um, so there's, there's lots of ways in which I think um, the decline of the institution does have tacit effects. And they're, they're very, you know, impossible to, to measure in some ways, maybe. I mean, they're, 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 it's, it's, it's a hard, it's a really, it's a harder argument to make than I think conservatives are used to making. Because we mostly only make it to ourselves mm -hmm. at our conferences so we can raise lots of money. <laughs> uh, and we make it, because of that, we make it among people who share, who largely share our presuppositions and our commitments. And so we don't realize, once you step outside of those, just how difficult a case it is. Um, but it's really hard. So do you think that the persecution narrative will backfire on conservatives? Well, let me uh, ask it this way. I mean, do you want to join team or being persecuted? I, as a sales pitch, um, hey, come hang out with us because we're being persecuted doesn't do much for me. Um, uh, I don't know if it will backfire. I don't think it's the best way of um, interpreting what conservatives are facing right now. Mm -hmm. I think actually we ought to talk a lot less about whether we're being persecuted. Like as this goes forward, I hope like we don't even in one sense ask the question. Um, I I think that what we should ask is is you know um, X bill before us promoting the right and the good, or is it not? Um, is this a just thing for us to seek as a society, or is it not? Um, if people want to, to be really hostile towards Christians and um, be angry and call us bigots and not invite us to uh, their parties to give prayers and so on, okay. Great. Um, in one sense, I think we ought to just laugh a lot of that off and um, uh, get on with our business. Yeah, well, we'll see, uh, I guess, if people take your advice. If, look, conservatives are so committed right now. Conservative evangelicals are so committed to ending sex trafficking. Like, we, 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 we internally talk about that more than any other issue. And at the end of the day, um, I think if people want to persecute us, okay, we're going to end sex trafficking. What are you going to do for the world? And I hope that's the winning narrative. Right. I think it's a lot more fun and happy and attractive than um, quit persecuting us. Right, but... You don't see it that much. Yeah, I know. So, you know, um, vote me for president of <laughs> evangelical dumb or something like that, right? I, um, I make this case all the time internally. I, I, really, um, I really do think conservatives need to be a better job of being joyful um, and, mm -hmm. and not a sort of deep joy that is just sort of happy regardless of what comes, a joy that recognizes these are sober, serious issues, um, but a joy that uh, communicates that, look, one way or the other, we're going to be okay. Right. Well, <laughs> you're not hearing a lot of that these days, <laughs> but everybody who watches Blocking Heads will hear it from you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Well, listen, as always, it was a really interesting discussion, and I appreciate you doing it. Thank you, Sarah. Really my pleasure. I always love talking with you. Thanks, Matt. Take care. Yep, bye.